Okay, hi guys, this is lecture number three. Today we're going to talk about cells. So we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of cells and all of the different components that make up a typical animal or human cell. And then we're going to get into the details of how molecules are transported across the membrane of cells many different types of membrane transport, um, and we'll talk about all the different types and how that happens. Okay, so first, cells are the smallest living unit and the basic building blocks of the body. So every cell in the body is part of a tissue, organ, or organ system, performs a basic and specialized function to maintain homeostasis. So in other words, the cells in your body, which are made up of many different chemicals, in the previous lecture we talked about macromolecules, so all those macromolecules make up different components of cells. Those cells then each maintain homeostasis to keep each cell alive, and in each of their specialized ways of maintaining homeostasis and functioning, they then make up individual tissues. Tissues then make up organs, organs then combining all of their specialized functions to make up organ systems. Many organ systems together to make the complete organism, which is the human body. So cell theory, the classic cell theory, is that the cell is, again, the building block of life. So these are um, the formalized parts of the cell theory from Table 2.1 in your textbook. So the cell is the smallest structural and functional unit capable of carrying out life processes. So no cells, no life. The functional activities of each cell depend on the specific properties of the cells structurally. So how each cell works depends on what it is made up of. So we'll talk about the different um, specialized organelles of the cell and how when cells have different functions, they have different organelles to help them achieve those functions. We are, as humans, multicellular organisms, and so we have many, many cells, and cells are the building blocks of multicellular organisms. Of course, there are examples of organisms in biology that are made up of single cells, and they have specialized components which allow them to survive with just a single cell that can perform many functions. Okay. An organism structure and function ultimately depends on the characteristics and functional capabilities of its cells. So we are limited structurally and functionally based on the cells that make us up. All new cells and new life can arise only from pre-existing cells. So cells divide through the process of mitosis. Sex cells divide through the process of meiosis. And in either one of those ways, that is a way to make new cells. So all new cells in new life have to come from the division or the copying of pre-existing cells. Because of this continuity of life, the cells of all organisms are fundamentally similar in structure and function. Although you guys will see when we look at the human body how just how different and unique different specialized cells can be. Today we're going to talk about general animal cells um, and as we go through the different units of this course you will see the cells of the specific organ systems and how they change in structure function. Okay so I want to spend some time with you reviewing cell structure. We're going to talk about each one and then we'll draw a summary diagram to remind you of all the different components that make up a cell. So here's a list here, and we're going to go through each one of these individually. There is a summary diagram in your textbook, figure 2.1, page 24, um, for this current edition um, that I want you guys to refer back to and be able to both visually and functionally identify the components of a cell. 
we're going to start with the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane separates the outside fluid or the extracellular fluid from the inside fluid or the intracellular fluid. It is primarily composed of macromolecules called phospholipids. Phospholipids are in a double layer so it is primarily composed of a phospholipid bilayer, or two layers of these phospholipid molecules. I'll show you those in a sec. Inside the phospholipid bilayer, there are floating proteins, cholesterol, and carbohydrates. Many different types of proteins, few different types of carbohydrates, and then cholesterol. They can span across the membrane, in the case of proteins. They can mark the outside of the membrane, in the case of carbohydrates and other proteins, or they can signal inside the phospholipid bilayer. Also, if you review back to um, the basic function of cells from your anatomy course, is that plasma membranes have selective permeability. In other words, the plasma membrane can control the entry of molecules and the exit of molecules. It can control what comes in, such as nutrients that we need to help our cells function and make energy. It can bring substances into the cell, molecules building blocks, for example, that the cell needs to make other molecules. It can also control the export of waste, as the cell metabolizes and does its normal functions, it can remove waste. And it can control the export of products. So if you have a secretory cell, for example, um, a digestive cell um, in the digestive system that is secreting a lot of digestive enzymes, it will export those products and control what is being exported out of the cell. Also, the membrane um, serves as a protective barrier to prevent the entry of unwanted substances. That can include anything that the cell doesn't want um, out of balance, so it can um, control, for example, the certain amounts of electrolytes and ions. It can also go all the way up to keeping pathogens like bacteria and viruses from getting into a cell. So all of this is what the plasma membrane does. It first provides structure, and second, provides selective permeability. Here's a very simple diagram of a cell where we have the phospholipids here in orange that make up the lipid bilayer. So the phospholipids, there's one layer, and there's a second layer, and the tails point inward towards each other, to make a lipid bilayer. This lipid bilayer made up of phospholipids separates the outside of the cell or the extracellular fluid from the inside of the cell or the intracellular fluid. A little bit more on membranes in a bit, but now we're gonna move on to the nucleus. The nucleus is the structure um, generally in the center of the cell, although sometimes it gets pushed off to the side. Um, it, in our general cell, it's in the middle of the cell. The nucleus houses the DNA. So structurally, the nucleus is the largest single organelle. It's usually spherical, although there are some exceptions to that, um, and it's usually near the center. It also has its own membrane, a double-layered phospholipid membrane that we call the nuclear envelope. There are tiny pores or nuclear pores around the nucleus that allow some molecules into and out of the nucleus. The nucleus houses the DNA, that is its primary function, and DNA is the genetic material that directs protein synthesis and serves as the genetic blueprint during cellular replication. We've already had some introduction to that in our macromolecules portion of the chemistry lecture but we will talk more about DNA. We have a specific DNA lecture soon. The next component of the cell is the cytosol. The cytosol is the majority of the intracellular fluid, so sol for solution, cyto for cells. It is a semi-liquid gel-like fluid containing molecules, ions, water, and other substances used and produced by the cell. 
some molecules actually can't float freely in the cytosol, and for these molecules, vesicles are used. Vesicles are membrane-bound bubbles, kind of. They're not really bubbles, but I'm going to say bubbles in quotation because they look like bubbles. They're little membrane-bound structures that are usually spherical that contain concentrations of molecules being carried throughout the cell. And these are molecules that normally would not be dissolved in the cytosol, or the cell wants them so concentrated that it's going to concentrate them in vesicles. The next is the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum, there is um, rough endoplasmic reticulum, and there is smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum you can think of as the factory of the cell. Rough endoplasmic reticulum synthesizes and releases new proteins. For example, hormones, enzymes, membrane proteins. It also synthesizes lipids, membrane-bound phospholipids to recycle portions of the membrane and other fats or lipid molecules made in the cell. It is called rough ER because it is covered in ribosomes, which gives it a rough appearance. There's also smooth ER. Smooth ER is also a factory, but it also is also a storage site. So smooth ER is both storage and transport of raw materials. So it can store and transport proteins and lipids made by the rough ER into small transport vesicles being sent to the Golgi. Smooth ER is called smooth because it has no ribosome, so it does not have that dotted appearance that the rough ER has. So here are pictures of rough versus smooth ER. So rough ER is over here on the left, which has the ribosomes on it. Smooth ER over here on the right, which has no ribosomes. Both are long membrane-bound networks, which molecules can be synthesized and transported. From the ER, then we get to the Golgi. Think of the Golgi as the mail room of the cell. So Golgi looks like little flattened stacks of pancakes that are closely associated with the ER or the endoplasmic reticulum. So all of those molecules that are synthesized in the ER will be sent to the Golgi to be sorted and packaged. So if the ER is the factory, the Golgi is the place where they get sorted out and packaged for their final destination. So these molecules will be processed, packaged, and exported. We can process proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum where the proteins can be modified. They can sort and segregate different products of similar functions into individual components. They can package products into large secretory vesicles marked for their final destination by surface marker proteins. So here is a picture of the Golgi, looks again like stacks of pancakes, um, and here are the um, vesicles after they have been sorted and packaged by the Golgi. So each molecule here, we've got green molecules, here we've got yellow molecules representing the sorted and packaged molecules containing finished product ready to transport to their next destination. That started out as mixed up packages of molecules from the endoplasmic reticulum where several of the molecule, molecules that were made in the ER were sent to the Golgi to be sorted. If we put together the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi, we have what's called the endomembrane system. In other words, a network of inner membranes inside the cell for producing, sorting, and packaging molecules in the cell. So starting with the instructions in the nucleus to the endoplasmic reticulum where the molecules will be made, 
They will then be transported in transport vesicles to the Golgi. Those vesicles will fuse with the Golgi, bringing their contents into the Golgi. The Golgi will then sort them. Here we've got yellow over here, green over here, just as an example. And then it will send the final products out to their destination. So they may stay in the cell. Here's an example of a vesicle that stays in the cell. Or they maybe actually continue to be exported out of the cell if it's a secretory cell or a cell that's producing, say, enzymes or mucus. So secretory vesicles are then the final vesicles that would fuse with the outside membrane or the plasma membrane, and then those would be products leaving the cell. One example of a specialized vesicle that, is contain, that, that contains many, many digesting enzymes is a lysosome. So a lysosome is a large vesicle um, that is a spherical shape and it's filled with harsh, harsh degradative digesting enzymes. It's enclosed in a membrane like any vesicle is, but it's much larger than your typical vesicle. These lysosomes are there to be the garbage cans of the cell. So in other words, any worn out cellular material, um, any pathogens that are found, uh, bacteria, etc., that are found um, uh, by the cell and, and, and brought into the cell um, can be brought into the lysosome to be broken down. There are about 40 different hydrolytic enzymes, or in other words, breakdown enzymes, that will break down cell debris, molecules, bacteria, pathogens um, for the cell. Another specialized vesicle for the cell is a peroxisome. So peroxisomes look like large vesicles again, um, and they're um, membrane enclosed, spherical, just like any other vesicle, but instead of being filled with digestive enzymes like lysosomes, they are filled with oxidative enzymes. So what peroxisomes do is concentrate and break down hydrogen peroxide or other oxidating molecules to prevent cell damage. Hydrogen peroxide alone would be damaging to cells and prevent cell damage. As an aside, uh, the uh, bacteria around in our environment do not have peroxisomes, and that's why you can kill bacteria with hydrogen peroxide, but you can't kill your cells with hydrogen peroxide. So it uses oxidative enzymes to break down other harmful molecules as well, such as alcohol and toxins. Now, I don't know if it's true, but I had a student who told me she read an article that said that alcoholics have a higher number of peroxisomes than your average person. So, hmm, something to look up. So here is a picture of lysosomes and peroxisomes. And generally, I'll tell you guys, um, you can't really visually tell these apart. You would have to stain them for the particular proteins inside um, to be able to tell a peroxisome from a lysosome, although lysosomes sometimes are much bigger than peroxisomes. Um, in any case, they both look like large membrane-bound vesicles. For lysosomes, you have the breakdown enzymes, digestive enzymes, or hydrolytic enzymes. For peroxisomes, oxidative enzymes that will help to detoxify. Okay, the next organelle is mitochondria. Um, most people remember mitochondria back from when you studied cells in high school. If people remember one thing, it's usually mitochondria. I'm not sure why. Um, they produce energy in the form of ATP. So often mitochondria are called the powerhouse of the cell. So they are membrane enclosed, but they have an interesting uh, membrane. They are double membrane enclosed. We won't get into the evolutionary origins of that, but um, it's thought that mitochondria actually evolved from bacteria for that reason. They are rod-shaped and they are very large and look um, like little beans, kind of, in that shape. Um, they contain their own DNA and they have inner compartments made up of stacks called cristae with an inner gel-like matrix. They are converting nutrients into ATP and we'll have a whole lecture where we talk about metabolism and talk about how that happens during a process called cellular respiration. So cellular respiration uses specialized proteins and enzymes found within the mitochondria, in the matrix, and in the membrane to make ATP. So here's a picture of a mitochondria. 
again kind of looks like a little bean in cross section. Um, the, the, the folds are cristae. The, the inner part of the mitochondria is the matrix. Various different compartments that help the mitochondria sort out the different enzymes that it needs to make ATP. The next is the cytoskeleton. Cytoskeleton provides structural framework for the cell, it's often overlooked, but I find the cytoskeleton to be one of the more interesting components of the cell. It's kind of like a little highway. Um, organelles can move along the cytoskeleton, and also the cytoskeleton gives cells their very unusual shapes. So not all cells are spherical, like the cell in your picture. Many cells are, are sort of rectangular looking in the case of muscle cells, some of them are spindle looking. The cytoskeleton is going to give it that special shape and framework to maintain its shape. It also provides internal organization. So it's going to have, um, it's going to be a place where the organelles can hold on to and move along. Um, it can also provide movement. So cytoskeleton um, proteins form the basis of many movement-related structures. There are three types, basic types, of cytoskeletal proteins that make up the basic types of fibers or filaments in the cytoskeleton. The tiniest are microtubules. Microtubules are made up of something called tubulin protein. The next are microfilaments. They are made up of actin or myosin proteins. Those often become the movement or contractile filaments in a cell. And then intermediate filaments. Intermediate filaments are made up of thread-like proteins and are intermediate between filaments and microtubules. Microtubules being the largest, filaments being the tiniest, intermediate being in the middle. They will link together like chains in an internal skeleton to create this internetwork of fibrous and tubular proteins providing structural and other framework for the cell. As a sort of um, specialized type of cytoskeleton um, organelle are the centrioles. So centrioles are cytoskeleton organization centers. They are short cylindrical structures made up of microtubules. They anchor organelles, they can form cilia and flagella, and they also form the mitotic spindle during cell division to move chromosomes. In addition, we have an organelle that is newer in terms of research, and these are called vaults. Vaults, we think, although the research is, is still coming out, they're very likely to be mRNA and protein transporters, where they are, pro they are transporting mRNA and protein from nuclear pores to the cellular organelles. But they're still on uh, the subject of research, and we're not quite sure what vaults do exactly. We think they may dock onto the nuclear pores carrying the RNA from the nucleus, but they've just been discovered in the 90s. They're hollow, little octagon shaped, with holes similar to nuclear pores. Okay, this is a good spot to take a quick break. Um, we're then going to go into membrane transport. Before we go into membrane transport, um, I want to do a quick drawing um, of the organelles. So let's take a second to draw out all of the organelles from your list. And in fact, let's go back to the list so we don't miss anything. Okay. So let's review cell structure while we have a moment. Okay, so let's review cell structure. A basic cell has a plasma membrane, which is the phospholipid 
bilayer that separates the outside of the cell from the inside of the cell. A cell also has a nucleus, which houses the DNA. And then the endomembrane system. So from the nucleus, we have endoplasmic reticulum, which can be rough ER if it has ribosomes, or smooth ER if there are no ribosomes. This is where molecules will be made and transported in the cell. From the endoplasmic reticulum, we will have tiny transport vesicles that will transport those newly synthesized molecules to the Golgi. The Golgi will then package and sort the molecules and send out vesicles of those newly sorted molecules. Some of those vesicles will be used for secretion where molecules will be secreted out of the cell and those are secretory vesicles. Some of those vesicles will become specialized vesicles within a cell and depend on the cell function. Two examples of organelles that are made up of large vesicle-like structures are lysosomes, which are filled with digestive enzymes, and peroxisomes, which will be filled with oxidative enzymes. They look very similar and the difference is what is inside. In addition, we also have organelles in the cell that help the cell make energy, and those are the mitochondria. They make ATP for the cell. And we have, throughout the cell, structural proteins that will help the cell maintain its shape. Those are cytoskeleton proteins made up of microtubules, which were the largest, intermediate filaments, which are middle in size, and then microfilaments, which are the smallest. A small microtubule organization center is a centriole. A centriole can be used to create microtubule structures, such as the mitotic spindle during cell division. The last is a new organelle that is newly being discovered that is octagonal in structure and near the uh, nuclear envelope, and these are called balls. So these are all the components of a basic cell. And now we can move on to membrane transport. Okay, so for membrane transport, this is the basics of how substances get in and out of the cell. So the plasma membrane and the membranous organelles all form selective barriers where passages of substances in and out of a cell is tightly controlled. In order to survive, every cell must maintain a specific composition of fluid, molecules inside the cell, it must export secretions and remove waste and harmful substances. So membrane transport is the movement of substances across a membrane, either in or out. So to do this, we need to review a little bit about membrane structure. So the plasma membrane contains phospholipids. They are drawn here in orange in a double layer, cholesterol, carbohydrates, and proteins. So let's start with the fluid mosaic model. The fluid mosaic model is that the phospholipids form a fluid bilayer 
within which the other molecules attach to and float like icebergs, icebergs on an ocean. Cholesterol contributes to the fluidity and stability of the bilayer and is nestled within the tiny fatty acid chains of the phospholipids. Carbohydrates act as signaling or identification tags for the outside of the membrane. And proteins can have many functions. They make up over half of the weight of the membrane, and it really depends on the cell and the functions of the cell. But you'll have proteins that sit on top or just inside, and we'll call those peripheral proteins. And we'll have proteins that can span across the entire membrane from inside to out, and those are transmembrane proteins. So first a bit on phospholipid structure. So phospholipids have hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. And they arrange themselves in a bilayer such that the heads are touching the solution, either the outside or the inside solution, and the tails are oriented inward and touching inward. What this does is create a layer where the polar heads organize the solution on the outside but prevent any polar, charged, water, or water-loving substances from entering or passing through the inside of the membrane. In other words, this region of the membrane that is the nonpolar tails is hydrophobic, and it's going to prevent the passage of any polar or water-like molecules across the membrane. So this creates membrane selectivity, where the molecular structure of the plasma membrane is the key to its permeability, and it's mainly the structure of the phospholipids. The phospholipids are a double-layered barrier that allow only small or non-polar molecules across. In other words, go back to our macromolecules lecture, what are the non-polar molecules? The non-polar molecules are the lipids. Lipids, fats, oils, steroids are the only molecules that can get across the phospholipid bilayer. The outer region will be the polar heads that are hydrophilic and they will attract charged molecules, for example water and other polar molecules, but the center span of the lipid bilayer will be hydrophobic and it will repel charged molecules separating them from water. Proteins can form channels across the membrane that can selectively gate or allow charged molecules across. So here again we have our lipid bilayer. We have solutions inside and solutions outside of the cell and then the bilayer which prevents the passage of any molecules that have charge or polarity across the membrane. So how do molecules get across? Well they get across by going through protein channels. Let's draw this out for a moment. Okay, so you have a membrane that is made up of a bilayer of phospholipids with the tails pointed inward and the heads pointed outward. So these are polar heads on the outside and then non-polar tails pointing inward. What that does is it makes the outside hydrophilic, so solution can collect on either side of the membrane, but it creates a barrier, which is the span of the nonpolar tails, across which the 
water, like, polar, or any charged solutions cannot get across. So the nonpolar tails then are hydro phobic. So if you have a molecule that is a hydrophobic molecule, like a fat, well here's our fat, or lipid, then this molecule can get inside the cell no problem because it can get across the hydrophobic region. If, on the other hand, you have a molecule that is charged, or polar, it will get stuck on the outside of the cell. It will not be able to get into the cell. The only way this molecule can get into the cell is if we open up a door for it in a protein channel. So if we make a protein channel and we span it across the membrane, then it becomes a passageway for the charged molecule to get in like a doorway. Okay. So again, these transmembrane or proteins that span across the membrane of the cell can allow substances that wouldn't normally be able to get across to pass across the membrane. Some examples of this would be ion channels. Ions, remember, have charge, positive and negative charge. They can allow certain ions through, like sodium or potassium. Sometimes their gates are open all the time. If the gates are open all the time, then they're leaky ion channels, meaning that their ion can leak in and out. Other cases, more commonly, is that there needs to be a signal for the gate of the protein channel to open. Usually this is some kind of a cue electrical um, or chemical cue that will open the gate and allow the ion through. Only then can it move with its gradient. Water channels will allow water in and out of the cell through specific pores called aquaporins. And there are also large molecule channels with specific openings to allow large molecules in and out. Some transmembrane proteins can form carriers or transporters, transporters, moving substances in and out of the cell with the use of other molecules. These would be co-transporters that are similar to channels, but in addition to having a gate, they also need a uh, like a chaperone or a co-transport molecule. They'll have to trade for a molecule that is being transported in. There are also pumps that are similar to channels that are very selective, but they will transport molecules regardless of um, the gradients. And we'll talk about gradients in a second. Peripheral proteins are proteins on the outside of the cell, and they can be surface receptors or signaling proteins. Um, they can recognize and bind to various molecules in the environment, communicating changes in the cell. There are also internal signaling proteins that can recognize and bind to molecules inside the cell. Surface enzymes that can break down molecules in the environment outside of the cell. And cell adhesion molecules that can link cells together to communicate or hold cells together with nearby cells. So put together, here are some examples of proteins in a cell. So here we have our phospholipid bilayer. Then we have, here's a channel, transmembrane protein that would allow certain substances in and out. Here's a carrier protein that also lets substances in, but it requires another molecule to bind first. Here's a receptor protein 
that has some signaling on the outside or inside that's going to interact with molecules outside or inside the membrane of the cell. And so from here, we can talk about the types of membrane transport. So membrane transport is the movement of substances across a membrane, and it can either be passive or active. Passive membrane transport means that substances move across a bilayer without the need for energy. They can either move directly across the bilayer or they can use channels, but they are passive because there is no need for ATP. Active membrane transport is when substances move through the channels or carriers and it requires energy in the form of ATP. So the types of passive membrane transport are simple diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. And the types of active membrane transport are primary active transport, secondary active transport, and vesicular transport. We're going to go through each one of these, and I'll give you examples of each of these. Okay, so first we'll start with passive membrane transport. This is when substances move across the bilayer or through the channels without the need for energy. They can move passively due to gradients. There's two types of gradients that we will talk about in physiology. There are gradients due to differences in the concentration of chemicals or molecules. There are gradients due to differences in the concentration of ions or electrical gradients. There is an overall natural driving force towards equilibrium which is to equilibrate or equally distribute either electrical charge or concentration of particular molecules. So molecules are always moving. The overall direction is called the net movement. With a gradient, there will be net movement into or out of a cell until equilibrium is reached and at equilibrium, there will be no longer any net movement, or in other words, there will be equal chance of molecules moving in and out of the cell. So let's talk about gradients. So gradients can either be concentration or electrical gradients. For concentration gradients, there are more molecules of a specific substance located in one region versus another. Okay, let's draw this out. Okay, so for a concentration gradient, you have a membrane, and you have outside the membrane versus inside the membrane, and you have a particular substance, let's say sodium, outside the cell, and you have sodium inside the cell. If you have more on one side versus the other, then you have a concentration gradient for sodium. So we have high sodium outside and low sodium inside, we then have a concentration gradient which will move from high to low. So naturally, molecules want to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. This doesn't require any energy. This is a natural driving force to move sodium inside the cell or across the membrane from high to low. So this is concentration. Now if we take the same example, but let's throw in some other molecules. Let's throw in, say, potassium. Now I've put a ton of potassium inside the cell. And let's add a little bit more sodium outside the cell. So we had a concentration gradient for sodium to move in the cell. Now, for electrical gradient, we want to look at the charge of the molecules, and we want to count the charges. So let's count outside. One, two, three, four, five positives outside. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven positives inside. Now for electrical gradient, charge is going to also want to be equally distributed. 
In this case, it doesn't matter the type of molecule for an electrical gradient. It only matters the charge. So for an electrical gradient, we just count all the positives on either side, and you can see that we have more positive inside than outside. So in the case of the electrical gradient, then we have a driving force for the positive ions to move out. So in this example, we have electrical out. So for a concentration gradient, you follow an individual molecule. In the case of sodium, we have a concentration gradient for sodium to move in. For electrical gradients, you follow any molecules and you just count the charges. We counted seven positives inside, five positives outside. We then have a positive electrical gradient for positive ions to move out of the cell. Then we have an electrical gradient for positive ions to move from high positive to low positive. The positive ions will leave the cell. We have an electrical gradient out of the cell. Just checking, let's look at potassium. What is the concentration gradient for potassium? In this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six potassiums inside the cell, no potassium outside, so there is a concentration gradient for potassium to leave the cell. What's the electrical gradient for potassium? The electrical gradient for potassium is also for potassium to leave the cell because potassium is a positive ion. If we count up the positives again, lots of positives inside, potassium will want to leave the cell due to the electrical out. So a concentration gradient is when you have more molecules of a specific substance in one region versus another, but it's specific to each molecule. Other molecules will be ignored. For an electrical gradient, we count all the molecules that can contribute a particular charge. So any molecule with charge participates in an electrical gradient. For concentration gradient, we move from high to low concentration. For an electrical gradient, we'll move from areas of slightly negative to slightly positive or slightly positive to slightly negative. Opposites will attract. Or in other words, equal charge distribution. So we'll move from areas that have high positive to areas of lowly positive regions. Okay, here's an example of an electrical gradient. In this case, we have a positive gradient. So we count on this side of the cell, we have more positives on this side than on this side. The electrical gradient for this example would be to move towards equilibrium and the positive ions should leave the cell. Excuse me, the positive ions should go into the cell. So we have more positive outside, fewer positive inside. In this example, positive should move into the cell to balance everything out until you reach equilibrium and you have equal positive and negatives on either side. So here we had a positive gradient to move in the cell. Here we have equilibrium where everything is balanced. Here's a concentration gradient, and I think of this as the crowded elevator example, right? We sort of naturally have this sense that when things are crowded, they need to distribute. So in one region, you have a high concentration of molecules. In another region, you have a low concentration of molecules. Naturally, they will want to evenly distribute until you reach equilibrium, where you have an equal distribution on either side of that molecule. This will be specific to a particular molecule. So now that we understand gradients, let's talk about passive transport because passive transport uses the energy from gradients to drive transport. First, simple diffusion. Simple diffusion um, is passive movement of molecules from high to low. So this is our simple concentration gradient 
or our simple highly positive gradient example. You have a high gradient on one side, low on the other. Molecules are going to move from high to low. There is a natural physical driving force that wants the molecules to even out, and we'll say concentration for this example, in concentration. No energy is required then. The molecules will simply move from high to low. Now this gets more complicated when we talk about across a membrane because remember that not any molecule can cross the membrane. So only molecules that are small and nonpolar can get across the phospholipid bilayer. So if there is a small nonpolar molecule that's in high concentration on one side and low concentration on the other, then it will have simple diffusion to move across the cell. It does not need energy or channels to do so because the membrane is permeable to these small nonpolar molecules. They are allowed to cross the membrane. There are five different ways that simple diffusion can be affected. First is the magnitude of the concentration gradient. The bigger the difference across, the greater the magnitude, the higher the driving force and diffusion will go faster. So a big difference from one side of the cell to the other in concentration will give a high driving force and diffusion will go faster. Surface area, as you have higher surface area on a membrane, you can also diffuse faster. How soluble or how easily the molecule can get across the lipid bilayer will also increase the rate of diffusion. So if it's more lipid soluble, it'll diffuse faster. How big the molecule is. Now this one is opposite. Just remember, big things move slow. So a big molecule, which has high molecular weight, will slow that molecule down. It will not diffuse as well. It'll decrease the rate of diffusion. And last, is the distance. Again, this one is the opposite. The farther a molecule needs to travel or the bigger distance it takes to cross that membrane, some membranes that are very thick, will decrease the rate of diffusion. So the best diffusion will be a thin membrane, very small, a small molecule, a very lipid soluble molecule, a lot of surface area with a high concentration gradient. That will be the fastest and best simple diffusion. Now, as I said, small nonpolar molecules will be simple diffusion. What about all the other molecules? Any other molecule that is too large, or if it is polar and carries a charge, it cannot cross the phospholipid bilayer without a channel. But with a channel, It can move from high to low concentration using its general diffusion driving force. So facilitated diffusion is passive movement. It does not require any energy using a gradient from high to low, but the membrane would normally stop those molecules. If the membrane would normally stop those molecules, then they need some help of a channel. No energy though, just because there's a channel doesn't mean there's energy and I see students always get this mixed up on the exam. So circle this right now and right on this slide, there is no energy required for facilitated diffusion. It only needs a channel. So facilitated diffusion across a membrane is for molecules that are large or polar and they cannot cross the phospholipid bilayer without a channel. But with a channel, they'll move from high to low without the need for energy. So facilitated diffusion uses carrier or channel proteins to, use mo to move molecules down their concentration gradient. So you have a high concentration on the outside, a low concentration on the inside, just like for simple diffusion, but normally the membrane would stop this molecule because it's polar or it's too big. So here then we have a channel that spans the membrane. The molecule can enter the channel, and then enter the cell. No energy needed. So facilitated diffusion uses a carrier 
or channel protein to move molecules down their gradients without energy. Facilitated diffusion, however, is limited by channels. So just like if you look around the room and you're in a crowded room, there is a limit to how many people could exit the room based on the number of doors or the exits in the room. So facilitated diffusion is limited by the number of channels that are present. Molecules have to wait their turn if not enough channels are present to allow movement across the membrane. This sets a maximum transport capability that we call Tmax or transport maximum. In other words, if all of the molecules back up at the channel, the channel is full, you have to wait until the channel is open for that molecule to get through, or available for that molecule to get through. The more channels you have, the more doors you have to exit the cell or enter the cell, the faster molecules can move out of or into the cell. So we can graph this looking here at this graph. So normal diffusion would start here where you have a rate of transport and the concentration of the cell. So normally if you have enough channels or doors for the molecules to get, to, we'll say, out of the cell, then we can transport as many molecules that are trying to get out as we have channels to get out. It'll track, 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 track. Simple diffusion looks like this too. Just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going until you have a high enough concentration of molecules that you will get stuck or backed up. So at this point where it curves is when you reach the concentration of molecules that can fit through the number of channels that you have. Simple diffusion, this is not the case because they can just go straight into the membrane. So simple diffusion just keeps chugging along. Every molecule that's added in concentration can just keep going and get through the membrane. Facilitated diffusion, however, when you run out of channels or you hit a maximum number of channels, you hit a maximum amount of molecules that can get through those channels. So if you have five doors and you can get two people in a door at a time, then your Tmax is going to be 10. That Tmax cannot change until you add more channels. So it levels off here and gives a maximum to facilitated diffusion. All right, osmosis. So osmosis is a special form of diffusion that applies just to water. So osmosis is the passive movement of water down its concentration gradient. It depends on the solute concentration and it depends on the water concentration. If we just look at osmosis from the perspective of water, water moves from areas of high water to areas of low water. So water will move, just like any other molecule, from high to low. So in this example, we have pure water here, and then water with a solute inside. Let's say this is sodium chloride or salt. In this example, this is the highest possible concentration you can get of water, right? It's pure water. But on this side, the concentration of water is a little bit lower because some of that space is taken up by the salt molecules. So water, in this case, is going to move from high to low concentrations of water. Now where this gets confusing is that we don't ever measure in practice the concentration of water. We either have pure water or we have some kind of solute concentration. And we always express this in relation to the solute. So we will never say water moves from high water to low water. We will always do this in reference to the solute. So instead what we say is that water moves from areas of low solute, like the example of pure water here, to areas of high solute, like the example inside where we have some salt solution. Another way of thinking about this is that water follows 
solute. So in areas where the solute or the molecule concentration is higher, the salt or the molecules will draw the water in. So osmosis is an area of high water or low solute moves to an area of low water or high solute. In other words, water follows salt or water follows solute. Water will move to areas where the other molecules are higher. And that's osmosis. A couple of terms for osmosis. First, osmolarity, the total concentration of solutes per liter of solution. Again, we never measure the amount of water. We measure the amount of solute. We measure the... <laughs> There's my phone. So a couple of terms we need for osmosis. First, we never measure the amount of water. We only measure the amount of solute. So osmolarity is the total concentration of solutes per liter of solution. High osmolarity means you have high number of solutes. High osmolarity will attract water or pull water in. And we express this in molecules per liter or in small amounts, milliosmoles per liter. We then can talk about how solutions can affect cells. And different osmolarity solutions or different concentration solutions will affect a cell. So you have a cell, you put it into a solution, and what happens to the cell? The tonicity then is the concentration of that solution relative to the inside of a cell. If a solution is isotonic, then the amount of solutes in your solution are the same relative to the inside of the cell. The cell will stay healthy. If a solution is hyper, think of a hyper kid, then you have high number of solutes in the solution relative to the inside of the cell. In that case, the water inside the cell will be attracted to the solutes outside of the cell and the cell will shrink. The last is hypotonic, and I always draw hypo with a big O, is when you have low solute concentration of the solution relative to the inside of a cell. In this case, the water in the solution will be attracted to the inside of the cell because the inside of the cell will have more solutes and the cell will swell. Here are some typical examples with red blood cells. If you take a solution and you place a cell inside, different osmolarity solutions. This is what you get. For a red blood cell sitting in isotonic solution, the cell will stay healthy and have its normal biconcave shape. For a red blood cell sitting in a hypo tonic solution or low osmolarity solution relative to the inside of the cell, then water will enter the cell and the cell will swell. Sometimes they swell so much that they burst. For a cell that is placed in a solution that is too salty or a hypertonic solution, water will leave the cell towards that salty solution and the cells will shrink. This is important to remember, for example, if you're giving a patient an IV of saline that will contain medications. A saline IV will always be isotonic because we want to make sure that if we're putting anything into a patient's bloodstream that it's isotonic to the cells. So it will be 300 milliosmoles per liter or 0.9% isotonic or normal saline is what you will see when you see these saline bags at the hospital. So remember that fluid balance is a major factor that is regulated by homeostasis. So the kidneys are going to very carefully regulate the composition of water and solutes in the blood to prevent this kind of issue of cells shrinking or swelling based on the blood solution. In other words, the kidneys will regulate the osmolarity of blood so that the extracellular fluid, which comes basically from the blood, 
is isotonic to the body cells in order to make sure that the cells are healthy. And we'll talk more about kidneys later. Two forces will make the equilibrium of water more complex, where the volume of water can also have an effect on equilibrium. So what we've been talking about so far is osmotic pressure, and this is the force of water moving towards solutes, or the solutes pulling the water towards them. This the majority of cases in the body will depend on osmotic pressures, or how much solute is present inside versus outside the cell. In some cases, we also have to think about hydrostatic pressure, and that is when the fluid or the amount of water is high enough that the force of the water against the cell becomes a condition. In this case, hydrostatic pressure is when water is being pushed due to fluid pressure. So hydrostatic is mainly a factor in certain conditions when say space for cell expansion is limited, or in the case of, say for example, blood pressure um, coming into tiny capillaries where the amount of blood pressure pushing on water against a barrier can create different gradients. Okay, so now on to active membrane transport. So active membrane transport is the movement of a molecule against its concentration gradient. So this is the case where you want to move a molecule no matter what, and it requires channels, carriers, and energy in the form of ATP. This is used when a cell needs to move a substance in, no matter what its gradient. So for example, we need nutrients in the cell, even if we already have a high number of nutrients in a cell. We need to remove wastes, even if we have a high buildup of waste in the cell. Actually, especially if we have a high buildup of waste in cells, we need to pump that waste out of the cell. So we need these pumps, which use ATP, to bring substances in and remove them. We can also use pumps to set up or replenish gradients. The energy will be in the form of ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate has three high energy phosphate bonds. Energy will be released when a phosphate bond is broken, and that forms ADP. So ATP can be broken down into ADP plus PI, or phosphate group, and when that happens, energy is released. So molecules that split phosphates to form ATP are called ATP ases, ase means breakdown, so they break down ATP to release energy. There are several types of active transport. So first, primary active transport. This is when a carrier protein uses ATP directly. In other words, it actually inside the protein, there is a place where ATP can be directly broken down and we often call these ATP ases or pumps. So a very common one in biology is the sodium potassium pump, which uses its own ATP ases directly to pump three molecules of sodium for every two molecules of potassium. And it will do this actually to set up sodium and potassium gradients that can then be used for electrical or other activities in the cell. So here we've got three sodiums being pumped out when ATP is broken, and two potassiums being pumped into the cell due to this intrinsic ATPase activity. So it doesn't matter if sodium is already high on the outside of the cell, or if potassium is already high on the inside of the cell. Completely independent of the gradient, the sodium-potassium pump will establish sodium outside, potassium inside. And it requires energy to do that because you can no longer use the energy of the concentration gradients. Secondary active transport is actually using ATP indirectly. So it uses gradients like sodium instead of ATP directly but it's lumped under active transport because it required ATP to set up those gradients to begin with. 
there are two types of secondary active transport. There's symport, where one molecule will move in the same direction as its partner ion, the partner ion being whatever is the gradient. So in this case, the same direction as sodium. So if sodium is the partner, it's using the sodium gradient. Sodium wants to move from high to low, and it will naturally do so. It will move, use the energy from that sodium gradient to drive another molecule. If they go in the same direction, that's symport. In other words, you can think of it as piggybacking. So sodium is high to low, and they'll move together. Antiport is when the molecule moves in the opposite direction of its partner ion. So we can still use sodium. Sodium wants to move into the cell here in green. There's symport here in green. Here's antiport. Sodium still wants to move from high to low. It took energy to set up that sodium gradient. And now this other molecule can swap or trade places with sodium. And that's called antiport. So if the molecule moves in the same direction with the sodium gradient, it's symport. If it moves in the opposite direction of the sodium gradient, it's antiport. And it's active transport because it initially required ATP to set up that gradient of sodium to begin with. So you have a driving ion, which in this case is sodium, that moves from high to low. That initially took time to set up and ATP in a prior step, such as a sodium potassium pump. And then you have your transported solute, which is the one you want to move, that will piggyback with sodium to move along with it. If it doesn't piggyback, if it instead swaps, then that's antiport. So primary and secondary really have to work together. So secondary active transport requires the primary active transporters to establish the concentration gradients of the partner molecules, for example, sodium. So in this case, here is a sodium glucose. Is it symport or antiport? Take a look. Are they moving in the same direction or opposite? Same direction. So in this case, you have sodium high on the outside of the cell, sodium low on the inside of the cell. That initially was set up through primary active transport and a sodium potassium pump. That is a step that required ATP. <coughs> then we can use that sodium gradient where sodium moves from high to low to piggyback glucose onto the sodium molecule. So the sodium opens up that transporter because of its gradient, and then the glucose, which is a nutrient, can then be moved into the cell. So in this case, it was primary active transport of sodium because of sodium potassium pump, and then secondary active transport using sodium as a partner for glucose. Vesicular transport is a special type of active transport that is quite complex, um, but we're going to simplify it here and, and, and talk about it at its, its very basic level. So vesicular transport is the movement of molecules or groups of molecules in and out of the membrane using vesicles. So this is often when you want to bring in a large amount of molecules um, or a certain type of molecule in a very concentrated form. So it's used when molecules are too large to pass through the channels moving high quantities, or we can also use it for engulfing large substances. There are two types, endocytosis and exocytosis. So for endocytosis, this is when you have a vesicle that brings contents into the cell. So here's a bunch of solutes, the vesicle pinches off, those solutes are brought into the cell, and then you have a vesicle inside the cell that's concentrated with that molecule. There's a couple ways to do this. Pinocytosis is when the cell takes in fluid. Phagocytosis is when the cell takes in large particles, debris, or, or say large bacteria into the cell. And the more complex we're not really going to get into is receptor-mediated endocytosis, where you're taking in a particular molecule 
based on binding to some protein receptors in the membrane. So here's pinocytosis, which is the example I put on the previous slide where you're taking in extracellular fluid, which includes water and other solutes. We also call this cell drinking. So this is pinocytosis or cell drinking. Phagocytosis is cell eating. This is when you have a large, say, bacteria or other particle that the cell is going to surround and bring into the cell. The last is receptor-mediated endocytosis, where you have a certain specific molecule that you want to target to bring into the cell. It'll bind to its receptors, and then you will only bring that molecule, not the rest of the extracellular fluid, into a concentrated vesicle. The last type of membrane transport, yay, I know we're finally getting to the end, huh? This is a long lecture for you guys. The last type is exocytosis, and this is when vesicles release their contents out of the cell. So where would they be made? Think about it. These molecules will be made in the endoplasmic reticulum. They'll be sorted and packaged, pack, sorted and packaged, <laughs> sorted and packaged in the Golgi, and then concentrated in a secretory vesicle. That vesicle will then fuse with the plasma membrane to release the contents out of the cell. This could be enzymes, it could be um, certain products um, that are made by the cell. Think of um, mucus, earwax, other kinds of things that cells make and release. So this is exo, exo for exit, where things will exit the cell. That is it for today. Thank you for your patience. I will see you guys soon and let me know if you have any questions.